everybody, welcome back. We are in the last PowerPoint uh, for human evolution, and we are going to meet the archaic or pre-modern humans, including the archaic versions of ourselves. And then we're going to take a quick look at modern versions of ourselves. And, and much like your other labs, you're going to be doing comparisons um, of skulls and various portions of the body. So I wanted to start the archaic homo PowerPoint uh, with a little bit of information about climate change because um, prior to this uh, and up until about 2.5 million years ago or so, the climate in Africa where humans are, hominins are evolving is relatively stable and, and consistent. And as a result of this, there's not a lot of major changes. Um, it's not until Homo habilis when we start to see rapid fluctuations of climate in Africa where we have wet and dry and wet and dry. Um, and the cause of this is actually interglacial and glacial periods that are happening during the Pleistocene. So you can see that during an interglacial period, meaning when there's less ice captured in the Arctic environments, that we have kind of a lush, wet, uh, African terrain. But during a glacial period, when more of that ice is locked up or more of that water is locked up in glaciers, we have a dry uh, desert-like uh, uh, environment. And so um, around 2.5 million years ago, Africa starts to fluctuate dramatically back and forth between these two. And we think that this is a big catalyst for um, the increasing brain sizes of the species that are evolving in Africa, and Homo erectus is one of them, which would eventually, of course, uh, travel outside of Africa. There's another species, Homo heidelbergensis, we're going to meet here in a moment, that evolved in Africa with an even larger brain and also traveled outside of Africa. And it is this species that we think um, may have been isolated long enough to actually speciate. So I mentioned in our last lecture that the uh, there's controversy as to whether or not, you know, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, um, are those distinct species or are they just variations on a single species? And that's not including the multiple other names, Homo rudolfensis, et cetera, that came up. Um, we know with certainty that the species that we're talking about here, Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapien, are distinct species from each other and in, because of genetics. And in in order for that to happen, um, Neanderthals must have been isolated from Homo sapiens for an extended period of time. And it's likely these glacial events, which not only are causing climactic changes, but they're also, especially in the north, I mean, look at, um, this is the Pleistocene, uh, at what North America looked like at the last glacial maximum, which was 120 meters thick, um, or 360, excuse me, yeah, 360 feet thick of ice covering a large portion of North America and basically all of Canada. Um, this is what's happening in Northern Europe as Homo heidelbergensis or pre-modern humans are traveling outside of Africa. And aside from climate fluctuations, one of the other things that may be occurring is changing migration routes, which means that individuals who had traveled outside of Africa, excuse me, and up um, into Europe may have gotten stuck up there. And this isolation would allow over time for speciation to occur. Um, and that may make sense of why Homo heidelbergensis, um, which is a species named after uh, the first fossil found in Heidelberg, Germany in 1907, um, is sometimes referred to instead as archaic or pre-modern humans. Um, now, the, the date range for this species, our oldest um, Fossil samples are around 800, actually 600,000 years old, but the molecular evidence suggests that Homo heidelbergensis must be a bit older. The most recent is 300,000 years ago. Um, now, what's interesting about heidelbergensis is that we think that this species, as it traveled outside of Africa, was isolated long enough to evolve into different species. And so um, Homo heidelbergensis in Africa, we believe, evolved into Homo sapiens, which would then ultimately leave Africa as well and populate the Earth uh, with the species we have now. Homo heidelbergensis that traveled up into Europe and possibly got stuck up there due to glaciations um, would evolve into Neanderthals. Um, and then we have Homo denisovans that are an Asian 
uh, species. We have uh, just a couple samples, uh, primarily from Siberia. So um, Homo heidelbergensis is believed to be ancestral to all of these species, which are distinct species from each other. We're not going to talk about Denisovans because there's simply not enough uh, physical evidence to, to understand them. But hopefully, uh, we did recently find a skull we think belongs to this species. So hopefully we'll get more information in the future. For Homo heidelbergensis, let's look quickly at the traits. So primitive traits, traits that they share with their ancestors. We still have this sloping forehead behind the projected brow ridge. Um, we have a long, low brain case that still has a relatively thick cranium. These would all be kind of Homo erectus-like traits that they're retaining. The brain size, though, has gotten larger, 1,250 cubic centimeters on average compared to about 1050 for Homo erectus. And the frontal and parietal lobe. So the frontal lobe, I think, is self-explanatory. This is uh, in the front of the brain, and it's where all the higher order thinking takes place, thought, planning, um, a lot of memories are housed, reasoning, impulse control. Um, the parietal lobes are on the, the top of the skull, the superior um, er, uh, area of the brain, and are responsible for a number of uh, senses, non-auditory, non-visual senses. And those areas appear to be enlarged um, in this species. The brain case itself is taller and slightly more rounded, um, and the breadth or the, the, the width of the brain is wider as well. The nose is finely uh, vertical and it's quite wide. The teeth are continuously less and less specialized, um, and Homo heidelbergensis is getting larger. They're getting taller. They're still a little bit robust, though. So um, the lifestyle of Homo heidelbergensis is, is interesting. Um, we have uh, pre-modern populations that appear to be living both in cave and open air sites. Um, Chinese archaeologists insist that many uh, Middle Pleistocene sites in China contain evidence of human-controlled fire. We think that Homo heidelbergensis was definitely controlling fire during their lifetime. Um, they were maintaining separate butchering sites. Um, they were possibly utilizing furniture-like um, objects or building objects that would work as beds or uh, areas of comfort. Um, this uh, species appears to be the first to potentially have taken advantage of fishing resources, um, making compound tools and spears, hunting weapons, um, and hunting large game. We do not see evidence of this in any species prior to this. So this is a big change. Um, and it may have to do with the increase in the uh, frontal lobe, which is, of course, something that uh, is associated with planning and reasoning. So you're going to have Homo heidelbergensis samples in your lab, and you're going to want to compare them with um, our next two species. The first is Homo neanderthalensis, um, the first of which was discovered in 1856 and named after its location, um, Neander Valley in Germany. Now, the samples we have range from 300 to 28,000 years ago, but much like Heidelbergensis, the genetics um, and molecular evidence suggests that Homo neanderthalensis probably evolved much earlier, maybe even as early as 700,000 years ago or so. Now, this is a genetically distinct species that evolved in Europe, and as Homo sapiens, we have, on average, about 2.5% of their DNA, which suggested that we mated with them um, successfully at least a few times um, in human history. So let's take a look at the distinctive traits of Homo neanderthalensis, um, and especially the traits that relate to the Arctic environment. So Homo neanderthalensis had a very large brain. They had the largest um, brain average uh, for any early human, 1,500 cubic centimeters. The skull is long and low, but notice this kind of uh, high uh, or more rounded brain case overall as well as the occipital bun and the supraniac fossa. So if you can't see my cursor clearly, let me just jump to the next slide. So you can see a difference between Homo neanderthal on the left and Homo sapien on the right. You can see where the occipital bun is, and then directly behind that is a little depression that you can push your thumb into, essentially. And this is called the supraniac fossa. Um, again, this is a lot of musculature. The, the skulls of Neanderthals were very heavy. Um, so these extra uh, projections, this occipital bun in the back, um, implies that they had a great amount of neck musculature in order to hold their heads up. 
um, thick and rounded brow ridge that kind of rounds over the eyes, as well as what we call mid-facial prognathism. So notice that Homo neanderthal has a very slender face and the cheekbones are kind of swept back. This is because the full face is pulled forward. Now, um, we've seen the mouth pulled forward. That's called prognathism. Um, Mid-facial prognathism means that the nose is also pulled forward. Um, and the nasal cavities of Homo neanderthals are extremely large as well. Um, and the nasal cavity and the, the pulled forwardness of the face are likely a response to living in Arctic conditions. Um, one theory is that the larger nasal cavity humidifies or warms the air from an Arctic environment so that it doesn't damage brain cells. And that's why this species had such large nasal cavities. And, and ultimately, this meant they had very large noses, which means that the face would need to be pulled forward in order to stabilize that nose. The eye sockets are also relatively round. Um, and one dead giveaway for um, your quizzes is the uh, more robust jaw with a retromolar space. So you see this gap. Um, in the back of the jaw of Homo neanderthalensis between um, the mandible and the uh, molars, that is called a retromolar space and is a distinctive trait of this species. We can see it here as well. You can see the face is pulled forward compared to a more flat face in Homo sapiens, which have chins, whereas Neanderthals do not. So familiarize yourself with some of these major differences between the two. On top of that, um, Neanderthals' bodies were also physically adapted to an Arctic environment. They were about five and a half to six inches shorter than Homo sapiens on average, um, with much wider chests, um, wider, broader hips, uh, and you'll notice that the theme here is larger, larger, denser bones. Um, and this relates to a theory, uh, well, Bergman and Allen's rules, which um, has to do with limb length. Um, and this goes across all species. So organisms that live close to the equator or in very warm environments tend to have very long, lanky limbs and, and uh, long ears, long tails, you know, depending on what type of animal it is. Um, like a homo sapien would, uh, because you want to increase the amount of surface area on the skin in order for heat to escape in a hot environment. So modern homo sapiens and, and even archaic homo sapiens are tall, long, and lean, whereas Neanderthals are short and stocky. And this is because we want to reduce the amount of surface area on the skin to prevent the loss of heat in an Arctic environment. Uh, the Lifestyle and culture of Homo neanderthalensis is much more expansive than anything we've seen before. Um, they were utilizing uh, up-close hunting techniques. Um, they were killing very large animals with spears, uh, which were tipped with stones made using a Mousterian technique, where they trim um, around a flint nodule in order to create kind of a disc shaped core that has convexity to it, almost like a turtle shell. Um, and so each time they struck the edge, they produced a flake, continuing, uh, continuing until the core became too small and was discarded. They then trimmed the flakes into various forms, such as scrapers, points, and knives. And these were called the Lavawa flakes. This is the first time in human history where you can predetermine shape and size, essentially. But this is a very complex um, technique that takes a long time. Something that Homo sapiens are doing at the same time is developing technology that is much less time consuming and much more efficient. So here we are, we meet ourselves, Homo sapiens, um, which is astute man. Now we are in the fossil record as early as 300,000 years ago. Um, and it's that first 150,000 years or so that are represented by what we call archaic Homo sapiens, meaning Homo sapien fossils that are transitioning still. They still have some of those primitive traits. Um, and the samples from 160,000 years and to present um, represent more modern Homo sapiens, which some scientists refer to, of course, as Homo sapien sapiens. Um, so let's take a quick look at the differences. Um, archaic Homo sapien traits, they had larger brains um, than, uh, than modern Homo sapiens on average. Um, notice that the skull is more rounded, um, but still slightly long. And in fact, you have this occipital bun um, in this particular image here. We still have somewhat of a brow ridge. Um, 
uh, and you know what's interesting about Homo sapiens that are archaic, the early versions, is that they were of course shorter um, than modern Homo sapiens on average, um, especially those in the Arctic. There's a significant amount of variation with tall, lean individuals in tropical Africa and shorter, stocky individuals in cold areas. Um, and while there's a lot of variation in the other hominin species as well, we don't see as significant of body variations as we do among. Uh, archaic Homo sapiens. We finally have that parabolic arch, um, where which we saw um, in a previous lecture, where the jaw is very rounded instead of being narrow. Homo sapiens have square eye orbits as opposed to the round ones we see in Neanderthals, and we have a chin. Um, you know, as the modern versions start to appear uh, in the archaeological record, uh, about 160,000 years plus we start to see that the brain size actually decreases a little bit. Now, remember that um, brain size and, and, and intelligence are not necessarily directly correlated. Um, archaic Homo sapiens were likely kind of more robust, similar to Neanderthals, and that would um, justify a larger sized brain. Um, we get longer, taller, lighter, and leaner um, as we become more modern Homo sapiens. And around 35,000 years ago, we developed this distinctive globular skull or short rounded skull that has no brow ridge generally, has a chin, and has very delicate facial bones um, with straight fingers, and in the body, again, we're getting taller, leaner, lighter on average, and a more narrow pelvis uh, because we're evolving primarily in equatorial Africa. Now, Homo sapiens are known for a much wider range of uh, tool technologies and more regional examples of tool tradition, so much so that instead of getting a single tool tradition, we actually have four tool traditions um, that we look at in the archaeological record. One example is this Aurignacian blade flake. It's 30,000 years old, found in southern France, and it represents a tool technology that is extremely efficient called punch flaking. So one thing Homo sapiens did um, that was new is instead of cracking stone to stone, they started using bone to crack stone. And when you use bone to crack stone, you actually have a greater amount of control um, over size and shape, and you're less likely to cause fractures in the stone. And so this is the punch flanking method, which essentially allows them to kind of maneuver their way in a circular motion around the um, nodge of the core here and just continue kind of slicing out little sharp flakes like these. So they're thin, they're sharp, they can be resharpened, um, and you're getting a lot more cutting edge per pound. Look at the uh, difference here. Homo habilis was only getting about two inches of cutting edge per pound of stone, um, eight inches for Homo erectus, two and a third feet for Homo neanderthal, so obviously a big jump there, um, but nobody comes close to us. We are getting as a species, excuse me, 10 to 39 feet of usable cutting edge from a single pound of stone. Um, and it's because of the efficient methods that we're utilizing to do that, which may have something to do with the structure of our brain, um, which we don't have time to discuss in this class, but is, is certainly something to um, look into if you're interested in that field. So um, in your lab this week, much like your last couple labs, you're doing comparisons um, between the skulls um, and in some cases the bodies of Heidelbergensis, Neanderthal, and Homo sapien. Make sure that you use descriptive terminology. Um, make sure that you reflect on how the Arctic environment is influential in the development of Homo neanderthals. Um, and we should be uh, able to get through this lab pretty easily. If you have any questions, though, of course, please reach out to me. Um, otherwise, I look forward to our next discussion.